Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to the BCP Council on Wednesday, the 27th of September 2023. Uh, my name is Councillor Vicky Slade. I'm the Chair of Cabinet and Leader of the Council. Uh, and uh, before we get going, I'm going to pass over to Sarah to cover the housekeeping. Thank you, Leader. Uh, please note that this meeting of the Cabinet is being recorded by the Council for live broadcast and will be published on the Council website for a minimum of six months. Please could everyone present follow these ground rules. Only speak when invited to by the Chairman. If accessing via Teams, always turn on your video function when invited to speak and state your name. Please use your microphones when speaking and please <coughs> turn off your microphone when you are not talking. And if you're accessing via Teams and you'd like to speak on an item, please indicate that you wish to do so by utilising the raise your hand feature in the bar at the top of the Teams window. For those in the room, if the fire alarm sounds, please exit the building by way of the nearest available signed fire exit route and make your way to the assembly point along Bradley Road under the flyover or in the surface car park at the front of the building. Finally, please ensure background noise is kept to a minimum and mobile phones and other devices are turned off or switched to silent for the jury. Thank you, Sarah. So moving through then, agenda item one uh, is apologies. Uh, we've had no apologies received to date, but Councillor Mike Cox um, is having to join us remotely um, due to illness, uh, which I, be I believe means that he is unable to vote. Does it also, just for clarity, mean that he's unable to propose a paper you see he's unable to propose or second any papers um but he is able to engage um freely as a member of cabinet as often as he wishes although from the sounds of him this morning i think that's unlikely um so get well soon mike and uh i've had no other apologies i just also while we're on that want to welcome um we have now paul could you clarify your your surname because i don't want to get it wrong thank you uh Leader. Yeah, my name's Paul Feely. Good morning, everybody. I'm the new interim director for PLACE. So uh, good to see you all. Look forward to working with you. Thank you. You're very welcome. Um, uh, new to the council this week. So I think this is probably your first formal meeting of BCP Council. So uh, uh, just in case anyone was wondering who he was. Um, so, uh, agenda item two, declarations of interest. I've had none received to date. Is there anybody that needs to add to that? We'll see if anybody thinks of anything as they go through. Please do make sure that you let us know. Agenda item three is the confirmation of minutes of the last meeting, which I'm happy to propose. Have I got a seconder? Yes, leader. I'm happy to second. Thank you. That's Councillor David Brown to second the minutes. And is not aware of any issues from those, so we'll uh, mark those tabled. Agenda item four, we've had no petitions or statements received from members of the public on this occasion, but we have had four questions uh, from two members of the public. Um, I believe that Alex McKinstry is going to ask his three questions, which all relate to agenda item seven, future of BCP, future places, limited investment and development and we'll also read out the question from Mr Sofianos relating to the send item agenda item 10 and we will um, I'm sure in as well as replying to the questions uh, clarify more about them as we come on to the debate so Alex thank you leader okay good morning cabinet uh, these are my three questions then um, first of all regarding item seven the future of future places the table on page 91 states the estimated costs of running future places until closure would be 1.06 million presumably office rental costs form part of that figure according to company's house the registered office of future places is bcp civic center but the company's minutes reveal that board meetings have also been conducted this year at 45 Westminster Bridge Road, Bourne Gardens in Exeter Park Road, and The View, which may be the same property, Bourne Park, also Exeter Park Road. Can the leader or portfolio holder for finance confirm how much rent and other charges are being paid for each of these premises and indeed for any other office space utilised by future places? Can we also be told which of these premises is being rented from a company associated with ex-councillor Drew Meller? 
Thank you, Mr McKinstry. Within the 1.06 million estimated costs of running Future Places Limited until its closure, an amount of 27,000 excluding VAT has been provided for in relation to premises rental office to Bourne Park. There are no other costs or payments relating this. The payment for this £27,000 was made to Hinton Road Investment Limited. Our understanding is that a former councillor is the sole director of Hinton Road Investment Limited. For completeness, in addition to the rent, a total sum of £4,726 excluding VAT has been paid over the last year for additional room hire, catering and alteration work. Would you like to ask your second question? OK. Continuing with operating costs, the Future Places Chair stated at last week's scrutiny meeting that notice had been given to ex-councillor Mellor's company in respect of that particular office space. When will the lease expire? What was its original duration, including the start date? And can we have details of any financial penalty imposed by the landlord in respect of early forfeiture of the lease? Thank you. I want to make a correction to what I said last at last week's overview and scrutiny board committee as part of this answer. Last week, I said that former councillor Mellor had purchased the building that future place is occupied. Former councillor Mellor has made it clear in public statements that he does not own that building. I am happy to accept that statement at face value and apologise to him for my use of that specific term. However, his company, Hinton Road Investment Limited, of which he became the sole director on the 5th of May 2023, according to the records at Companies House, licences these offices to BCP Future Places and had done so since August, the 20, August 2022 and has received rent from Future Places since then. Notice has been given to terminate that licence of January 2024, for which there is no financial penalty. As I said earlier, I apologise for saying that former Councillor Mellor had purchased the building. He may not own the building, but it is clear that he has acquired the company which is in receipt of the rent from BCP Council uh, and so BCP Future Places Limited and which licenses the offices to BCP Future Places Limited. Question three. Turning to table 12.1, which is on pages 83 to 84, and the reordering of Future Places projects in the event that regeneration is brought in-house. The two projects listed for priority delivery here are the Holes Bay Power Station site and the Dolphin Leisure Centre. Why these two sites? The Holes Bay project is, given the ambitiousness of the project, plus the known problems with the land, including flood risk and actual contamination, I would have thought a council with budgetary pressures would be giving this site a very wide berth indeed. I'd be genuinely keen to hear why this site is being prioritised, therefore. Ditto the Dolphin Leisure Centre and any other sites I may have missed. Thank you, Mr McKinstry. Holes Bay and Dolphin Leisure Centre are prioritised sites due to their potential to deliver much needed housing. And at the Dolphin site, a new leisure and pool facility, which is very much at the end of its life. I should stress that the purpose of buying Holes Bay in 2020 was to deliver homes. Indeed, the purpose of building the Twin Sales Bridge by Paul Council many years earlier was to deliver a new neighbourhood. And therefore, despite its complexities, it must be a priority for us. Future Places have worked to bring the former power station site at Holes Bay, which is the largest regeneration brownfield site on the South Coast, forward to a point where the site is ready for early discussions with investors to bring forward that development. It is a complicated site, but technology has changed and different options are opening up to deal with both, both flood risk and contamination. So on to Mr. Sofianos' question, which I believe you are reading and which Councillor Burton will respond to. Spread it. OK, this question relates to agenda item 10, uh, send accelerated timeliness. Today's paper reveals a key element of the Council's education service is struggling. 
the percentage of education, health and care plans completed within the statutory period is zero. The case backlog sits at 397. Council has been invited to join the safety valve program. This would contractually bind council to annual cost saving targets, but safety valve is controversial and participants like Kent and Berry have experienced huge issues and media headlines in pursuit of these targets. Notably, neither today's paper nor safety valve have been scrutinized by committee and signature is delegated to executives. Yet this isn't just a financial decision. It could have huge consequences for many children and families here. Could you provide reassurance that council will commit to allowing any contract and management plan to be properly scrutinized by committee before it is agreed, and if possible, bring it to a cabinet or a council vote? Thank you, Mr. Safianos, for your question and your continued interest in this extremely important area. Uh, before I answer your question, to help anyone who wasn't at Children's ONS last week, this question very much follows on from your question to that committee. Uh, what I say that then, when I introduce agenda item 10, will also, I hope, clarify my answer. Uh, following on from my answer last week, BCP has been invited to join the safety valve programme BCP has accepted the invitation to enter into negotiations. I would emphasize negotiations. Due to the size of the high needs block deficit, the council would be remiss not to enter into negotiations as a high needs block deficit represents a significant risk to the council. This is not a formal decision, but an agreement to negotiate. Therefore, an operational decision are within the delegated powers of the chief executive. The first step is to provide the DfE with the BCP 10 strategy, draft a DSG management plan and uh, delivering better value bid, which have already been done. When the negotiations are complete, any financial decisions will come before the appropriate council decision making body, as it is in the constitution, depending on the financial consequences, either positive or negative. To clarify, page 559 of the financial regulations within the Constitution provides the following. Accepting external funding, a BCP aggregate total, including any match funding element and partner, partners, share or shares, if BCP is lead body or host, up to 100,000 service director or with the chief financial officer, between 100,000 and 1 million cabinet stroke cabinet member with advice on the chief financial officer, and over 1 million council with advice from the chief financial officer. If officers are unable to reach a negotiated position, then I would report that back to cabinet for information. Um, I would like to assure you that I'm keeping a close watch on this process as my primary focus is improvement and outcomes for our children. I would also welcome scrutiny playing an active part in this. It has a vital role. I do however, also have the responsibility to monitor the impact of children's services on council's finances. Okay, thank you, Councillor Burton and Councillor Slay. Thank you, Mr McKinstry, and thanks to Mr Sofianos in his absence. So agenda item five uh, is recommendations from the Overview and Scrutiny Committee, which is to present any recommendations not otherwise included on the agenda. There are obviously um, some issues later on which uh, Councillor Bartlett will be involved with, but can I just uh, check, Councillor Bartlett, are there any uh, recommendations outside of the agenda that you would like to present? There are none. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett, and thank goodness for that, because I would have hoped to have known about it in advance. <laughs> uh, agenda item six is the quarter one performance report 23-24, um, which I am happy to propose. Do I have a seconder? Councillor Earl, thank you. So um, in introducing this paper, I just would like to start by expressing my sincere thanks to Bridget and her team for the work that they've done on this. Um, she, she will um, have um, experienced some difficulties in our challenge around some of these um, measures being a little outdated, possibly some measures that 
uh, not priorities for the administration going forward um, and an interpretation of success, which I think in July we um, we were challenging some of those. So um, this is the report on the first quarter. Obviously, the first quarter of the year um, feels like quite a long time ago now. So some of the actions which we've carried out in more recent months aren't included for that very reason. Um, but I just want to commend that to everybody um, and to ask them to consider the delivery plans attached. This is clearly a report that, although it's in my name, uh, covers every area of the council. Uh, and uh, there are a number of exception reports uh, which uh, cabinet members and directors will be working through to address areas of underperformance. Probably also worth mentioning that some of these measures will change over this year uh, in accordance with the new priorities of the council and the, the new budget framework of the council going forward. So um, they may feel like we're talking about something that is, is no longer relevant. So um, I'm going to leave it there because I'm sure people will want to talk about their specific measures. But I, I have to pay tribute to Bridget, who is leaving us um, in a couple of weeks, I think, Bridget, aren't you? Yeah, yeah, this is my last cabinet. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, yes, and uh, I, I have to say the credit for this paper comes to, from Vicky, who is um, shy on camera, um, but she will be picking up and carrying on with the other performance reporting. So, yes, my last cabinet, my last performance report. So thank you for um, for all of your support in pulling this together. And I do wish everybody the greatest success going forward from here. Thanks. And Bridget was instrumental in our first corporate strategy back in 2019 and has obviously been working to get our new vision and priorities underway. So, um, so you know, she will be missed and we look forward to working closely with Vicky in the future. So um, I'll open it up to, is there anybody from outside a cabinet that wishes to speak on this? I can see we have Councillor Canavan online and we have Councillor Bartlett in the room. I'm not aware that either of them have expressed an interest in speak to this one. Just give Councillor Canavan the chance to put his hand up if he wishes. If not, I'll throw it open to Cabinet. You would like to speak on this one. Wow, everybody's happy. Um, this will be an easy one for you, Bridget. You can get back to uh, tying up all your loose ends. So, uh, so it looks as though everyone is content that this is a, a good reflection of what we're doing. And I'm sure that each Cabinet member will be closely working on their, their projects within the performance. So um, with that, uh, if I can just ask whether we have consensus that we can, that we, well, we're considering it and that we are um, working on those areas. All those in favour and happy? Great. Great. Right, that is approved. Thank you very much. We move on to agenda item seven. I'm pretty sure that one's not going to uh, go through quite so quickly. Uh, so agenda item seven is the future of BCP Future Places Limited Investment and Development. Um, you can see here uh, that we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight recommendations, seven of which are for Cabinet to decide, and one of which is a recommendation um, from Cabinet to Council. Uh, this matter was um, taken to a special scrutiny last week, uh, which I'm sure Councillor Bartlett will update us on. But if I just start by saying I will introduce this paper, can I have a seconder for this? Happy to second, Leader. Thanks, Councillor Martin. So just an introduction then and to bring people up to date, um, this paper is considering the options that have been brought to us about the future of the urban regeneration company BCP Future Places. There are four, op to, to roll back a little while, people will know that this was set up um, in 2021 to focus on the regeneration of BCP. Its work has expanded um, over time to consider matters that are beyond the original scope and beyond what some of us would describe as regeneration um, to matters of uh, policy development, um, consultation uh, and areas um, whereby reports were being undertaken for, um, you know, for, for broader agendas. We were very clear when we 
took on the administration that one of the key things we needed to do is to review the future of this organization and to make a decision about whether it was the right model going forward. Uh, I think it's fairly well known that we had serious concerns about the financial uh, risk attached to the organization. The organization was running with a working capital loan, uh, which was uh, a few months ago at the point of 4.75 million drawn down and the trajectory for how quickly it would spend its £8 million uh, was that it would get to that £8 million very quickly unless uh, we were to uh, pay for some of the work that it had undertaken. And the model was that when a decision was made on an outline business case to take something forward, that's when the, the, the capitalisation would take place. Unfortunately, it's become clear that the current model uh, is not sustainable and that another option would be considered. We've worked really hard and I have to pay tribute to the non-exec directors um, who have really stepped up and gone well beyond uh, their remit in helping us to look at all of the areas um, and options. Uh, in particular, I need to pay tribute to Karima Fahili, Farmi, thank you, uh, who stepped in as interim chair um, after the sad death of Lord Kerslake. Um, they have done a lot of work to look at the scope and to look at the governance around the organisation and have worked with us, with the exec team, uh, to, to, to come up with the options here. I also need to stress that the recommendation to close the organisation as a, as a separate arm's length organisation is no reflection on the hard work and quality of the work that's been done by the staff who sit within BCP Future Places. Um, the fact that we are able to move forward with a proposed delivery on some of the sites pays tribute to the hard work that they've done and the reality is we wouldn't be able to take some of those schemes forward if they hadn't done the preparatory work over the last 18 months or so to bring forward schemes like um, you know, Holes Bay to, to this point. But uh, having said all of that, the recommendation is to go with option one, which is to close and bring the development and investment activities inside uh, BCP Council. And that's partly around the level of control that we can have partly around governance and partly around cost. Uh, there has also been a review carried out by Jess Gibbons and Ian O'Donnell internally uh, from the council to actually look and, and see whether um, this is the, the right, right model. Now, there are some costs involved uh, with making this decision. And those costs, as we've already heard, are around the running costs of the organisation uh, in its uh, period to closure. There are also costs involved by starting an in-house team. Uh, and that work will, will start immediately if this is approved today. But there are also costs in terms of the money that was set aside earlier this year as a provision um, to if, for, for the costs incurred so far in the organisation. So there is a range at the moment as, as to how much of that will need to be set aside and how much of it is actually going to be um, purchasing the work that's been done. And the reason that that is still in a range um, from a negative to a positive um, is because it's only been in the last few weeks that we've been able to get access to enough of the documents um, from the team at Future Places to consider uh, how closely the work aligns to the priorities of, of the projects going forwards. So I'm, I'm sure Councillor Cox is going to want to uh, elaborate on some of the finances. But before we go into a discussion, um, there was a really robust discussion about this at scrutiny last week. Um, there was a recommendation from uh, from the uh, committee, uh, which I was very happy to accept, and I think we probably need to discuss that separately. So I'm going to pass to Councillor Bartlett to tell us what uh, uh, the view of the committee was and the recommendations. But I am going to suggest that when we discuss it, that we discuss the item H separately, just so that it's easier for people to follow, if that's okay. Although you will actually, uh, I might bring you back in 
to discuss why you've made that recommendation, um, if that's okay, Councillor Bartlett. So I'm going to pass to you. Thank you. Thank you, Leader. In, in view of what you said, I'll just make the recommendation regarding the um, uh, recommendations A to G in the paper, and we'll talk about recommendation H later on. Uh, but yeah, you're, you're right. We had a, a very comprehensive, robust uh, scrutiny uh, of the paper, and um, basically the, the committee supported the recommendations in the in the paper. There were only two abstentions, and uh, the nine members voted to support the recommendations. And so the, the recommendation um, basically is that the Corporate Community Overview and Scrutiny Committee recommend to Council that recommendations A to G, as outlined in the report, be approved by Cabinet. That's all. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Um, and I am going to give um, yourself and Councillor Canavan the opportunity to speak as councillors, if you wish to, before we come into the into the Cabinet debate. But I, uh, before I do that, um, I do need to make it clear that should Cabinet or other councillors wish to discuss the detail in the confidential appendix at Appendix 5, the meeting will be required to move into confidential exempt session. So uh, I just make you aware of that. And if you do decide you want to talk about that, please let me know and we will uh, do the necessary. So um, I'm going to give Councillor Canavan the opportunity, if he wishes to, uh, to, to say anything on this one. Uh, and then, Councillor, yes, he does. Councillor Canavan, would you like to uh, share your thoughts? Uh, can I do that later on the agenda, please? Uh, the, the procedure is that the people outside of Cabinet speak before and then we consider your, your um, in our discussion. So if you want to speak on item seven, this is your opportunity. If you want to speak on items later in the agenda, then absolutely at those points we'll bring you in. Did you want to speak on item seven? Yes. Um, in right Did you want to speak on item 7H? Yes. About, okay, so if you speak about item 7H, I'll bring you back in then. If you don't want to speak on items A to G, then uh, then that's fine. I'll move you on. No, I have a, I have a question on A to G, um, if, I, if I may. Yeah, go for it. Um, so my understanding uh, is that if uh, this recommendation uh, goes through, and if a subsequent recommendation in relation to H goes through, then the special council meeting that had been arranged on the 5th of October will be cancelled. Um, so my question is, when will the, the full report on the future places that overview and scrutiny have seen and that uh, you as cabinet have seen today be available to be discussed at full council because if there is no meeting, uh, special meeting in October, um, I just need some reassurance that there will be some capacity to be able to raise issues in relation to this matter at the next full council meeting, which unfortunately is not until um, November. Thank you. So, so for clarity, this is a decision, this is a cabinet decision. The way that uh, the constitution operates is that a significant number of matters uh, that the council decides is decided by cabinet. Um, this is a cabinet decision. Every member of the council is entitled to um, come to scrutiny uh, and it's at the discretion of the chair of scrutiny and I know he is very good at allowing other people to speak. If they wish to come and speak and be involved in the discussion at, at scrutiny, that's always been an option, certainly since BCP Council started and we enabled that. And any member of council can come uh, to cabinet. But this is not a matter for full council. The decision around closure of future places is a cabinet decision and therefore the decision of the administration. The only item that would be coming to full council should that full council meeting go ahead would be H, and that would be the only matter that was to be discussed. So if H is to be deferred, um, I'm clarify with the chief exec, my understanding is that there would be no reason to have that special council meeting. So can I just get clarity from the chief exec on that? Thank, thank you, Lady. Yes, uh, but what my proposal was that if uh, Archimedes is deferred today, then I'll take a decision about whether or not we, we need the council meeting. 
There is very little other business. There is one urgent item, but I think I need to make that decision this week in order to, to achieve a decision. So uh, there'll be no need to, to hold that council meeting. Um, I need to then make a decision about cancelling it later today. Can I just come back to the fact that one of the reasons that we have asked officers to look at uh, a governance review um, is because there are people who don't feel that a cabinet and leader model is the right model and therefore decisions would be taken by committees uh, and uh, and therefore we have asked our team to start that piece of work which is quite a major piece of work for a council that's uh, in um, I think as somebody put it earlier financial distress um, that actually to prioritize that is something it's very difficult for us to ask officers to do um, but for those people who don't like the idea of a, of a cabinet system, that is one of the reasons that they don't like that. So uh, unfortunately, it isn't due to come back to council, and that is the way that the constitution of this council uh, is written. So Councillor Bartlett, as a member of the council, do you want to exercise your right to speak at cabinet? Yes, well, actually, thank you, Leader. And the first point does actually relate to the question uh, Councillor Kavanagh has raised. And all I would say is that... Um, whether the A, A to G goes before council, it's potentially, as the cost are not yet known of closing future places, should those exceed what's currently provided for in the current budget, and the costs then exceed that amount by another million pounds, for example, then it would have to, I believe, go to full council because it would be outside the current, current budget. Um, the second point I wish to make is regarding establishing another team within um, within the council for regeneration development purposes and creating a new director effectively. Uh, we need to remember, of course, why BCP was, uh, the, sorry, the Bournemouth Development Company was originally established. Uh, then also why we established Future Places, because the expertise, knowledge, uh, particularly the financial aspects of managing such big projects were deemed not to be available within the council. Now, um, we're sort of going back again and reinventing the wheel to a point in, in putting it back within the council. So those reasons that we created those companies, in a way, will still exist unless you can replicate the expertise and knowledge, uh, commercial acumen within the council. Now, I'd like to suggest that some of these that some of these uh, projects, particularly Holes Bay, which has already been ongoing for quite some time, is difficult. It's going to take a long, long time. And, and I'm just wondering if we should just be pausing a little before we create the directorate, just to reflect on where we are going, rather than just sort of attack it so quickly and make the decision now. I believe, given the current financial situation of the council, it may be better to just hold back for a while, see how the finances go, see how the funding of the transformation programme can go, and then review in maybe six months or, or a year's time. Uh, because I think it may be that we could be putting good money after bad, frankly, uh, by creating a new, uh, a new director in order to progress those developments. Uh, and actually, if there is no, no realistic uh, potential for those developments to come forward, um, certainly in the medium term, then we do have time uh, uh, to, to reflect for a while before we make that decision immediately. And, and, and where I'm coming from is, is the affordability of doing that at the, at the present time. That's all. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Just to clarify a couple of things, uh, which I should have said earlier, when I was talking about the staff from Future Places, um, we are hoping that the staff from Future Places will um, the, uh, to come within the council um, under the Chupi regulations. They have all had their, um, if this is accepted today, they will all be um, invited to become staff of, of BCP council. Therefore, much of that expertise should actually already be there. Um, I'm, um, Mr. Richens, can you just clarify in terms of if the if the cost is over one million pounds, does that because obviously we have a range of a saving of two point two three million up to a cost of one point two four million, 
is that already counted within the money that's been put aside within the budget or at what point would that have to be um, coming through to full council? And then I'm going to ask uh, Jess a question. Stand by. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Leader. Um, the table in um, section 52 of the report sets out the, um, the implications, the financial implications of the orderly closure of Future Places Limited. Um, and as discussed at the overview and scrutiny committee, that is in a range. Um, and that is in a range between £1.77 million and £5.24 million. But the council has already provided um, £4 million as part of the final closure of the 22-23 accounts. So the actual net impact is between um, you know, a total cost of 1.24 million or potentially a credit against that 4 million pounds of 2.23 million pounds. So based on uh, you know, the average and the midpoint of that, that potential range, it was considered that this did not need to come to council for full approval. Um, um, but you know, what the recommendations of the report make very clear is that we will go through that orderly closed down process and the outcome um, of that financial equation will be brought back um, to, to Cabinet for due consideration. And if that figure is exceeds the limit of Cabinet, then that would then trigger a need to take that element to Council? At that point in time, we'll consider the appropriate governance arrangements, yes. Thank you, Mr Richards. Uh, uh, Jess, or Ms Gibbons, or you Mrs Gibbon? I don't actually know. What do you prefer? What's your preferred? Um, Mrs, I think. All right, then. I might question myself on that. <laughs> Mrs Gibbons. Um, I have a question about, in relation to what Councillor Bartlett said. Um, obviously, we are looking to bring in the team from uh, basically Future Places, um, and obviously they'll be working within, within the Council. What is the urgency of bringing in a director? Because actually the directorate would simply be the people who are already here. Um, the question really is whether there is a need for a director to, to, um, to go into place or actually whether it's just terminology. Uh, because if we have a responsibility to bring them in under regulations anyway, then it isn't really a, an either or situation of trying to save the money because those people are our responsibility. Can you just clarify that? So under cheaper regulations, we have a responsibility to identify who, who will come across. We've committed to bringing all the staff across from future places. That will create a new directorate. What we're proposing in the report is that directorate also brings in the housing delivery team that sits currently within housing and communities, which is Nigel Ingram's team, and also um, brings in the commissioning team, which is Sarah Good and her team, which currently sits within infrastructure. The idea is we then need the leadership across that team. It may be that there are people appropriate through the cheaper process to take up that leadership. Um, it may be not, and it may be that that post is therefore vacant, and we would therefore look to recruit into it. I think it is about the leadership of that directorate. Um, we also need to work through how that impacts on the other directorates. Uh, and, the ha and ensuring that we're actually being as efficient as possible with the resource that we've got. Thank you. I think that seems lovely. Are you satisfied that sort of answers your question, Councillor Bartlett? Councillor Bartlett is nodding for the record. <laughs> okay, so with that, can I, <laughs> can I open it up to uh, members of Cabinet to speak on this one? Uh, I say, not speaking about out of H for the moment. We'll, we'll hold on to that. Councillor Hadley. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, I, and clearly this is a difficult decision to take. Um, it's far easier to start the ball rolling and set something up than it is to dismantle it and, and agree to stop it. Um, but the Council is in a significant financial distress. It does seem that the number of projects that future places were invited or, or required to uh, get involved in uh, was ever growing. And I think um, whilst in opposition, we were set, or certainly I was quite concerned about the idea that it would hit um, our revenue position for any project that wasn't pursued through to, to actual completion, that it could be capitalised if, if the project was completed. But otherwise, every one of these projects is a risk to the bottom line of our MTFP at a time when we're really struggling. Um, so I think you know that clearly for me is is a, a good reason to uh, to reconsider the, the model, and it was something that was changed uh, um, as we went through the future basis. Um, transparency of what happens is also a, a, a key element. There is something about how difficult it's been to get hold of the information, uh, um, uh, um, uh, which has been unfortunate. Um, 
I, I, I do have concerns, and I think you know one of those is about the capacity of the internal team and whether it's a new director or whether it gets resolved into another director is something I think you know we perhaps we should be looking at. But actually, the reason Future Place was set up was was a rationale that we didn't have the capacity and skills in inside our own organisation. So uh, um, I don't think that necessarily has has changed. There is obviously a, a choice for each of the individual members of Future Place whether or not they choose to come into into BCP. Um, and that's a, a risk to us, you know, whether the staff actually want to transfer. Um, we've got to try and make it as attractive as we can for them, and, uh, um, and clearly we have a duty to them. Um, but if they choose to go elsewhere, that's, that's up to them. And I think there's also something about um, seesawing, you know, the, the, the creating and folding structures is disruptive and it's difficult, and, and at a time when we need some continuity, we need some stability, um, it is really unfortunate to do this, so we need to go forward with some degree of certainty that we're not going to end up changing it again in a couple of years' time, because these projects are long-term, they take a long, long work to do. Um, I, I, the, the bit about Holes Bay and I'm pausing on Holes Bay that Councillor Parler just raised. Um, I, I, I think, even, even from my recollection, even back to the time when Gallagher owned the site, they were talking about developing part of the site, then developing other other bits of it. And I think you know we bought it in 2019 because it had stalled. It had been on a land bank of a big developer and wasn't going anywhere in a hurry. Um, we and certainly Borough Pool um, paid for the Twin Sales Bridge on the basis that it was going to be funded out of out, out of contributions from that development, and it never was. Um, so the people of Pool lost a lot of sill um, uh, contributions to fund that bridge. Uh, and so you know, there is a real uh, indebtedness uh, to uh, um, the pool uh, um, area for, for developing that system. And, and also, you know, we, we can influence and ensure that we're getting some social housing, some, some, some housing of benefit to people who are in need, um, as opposed to the Carter's Key development, which uh, was, was about uh, um, more, more luxury, luxury buildings by the previous administration. So I think it is important to try and do what we can on the whole space site. We do need to proceed with caution, with recognition of, of the financial constraints. Um, and, uh, and there are some clear problems there. That's why it was on land bank and not moving forwards. Um, but we, we, we should be able to at least develop part of that site and then have some funds from that to, to develop more. Um, so I'm, I, I, on balance, I think you know it's the right decision. It's a difficult decision. Um, Future Place have done some really good work, and we need to recognise that. But equally, model I don't think is fit for where we need to be. So I support the proposal. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hadley. Anybody else wish to speak on this? Councillor Brown? Then Councillor Martin. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, this is a, is a, is a difficult one, as, as, as has been said. Um, I, I think I entered into this debate, you know, well, some time ago, but, you know, certainly since the new administration was formed with concerns um, about the financial model and the mission creep and transparency of future places, but with a completely open mind about which way we should go and what was going to work best for for the council in, in how we approached it. I listened to the overview and scrutiny debate um, last week. It's a really complex issue to consider, especially in light of, as has been said, our sort of distressed financial position of the council. Um, I hear and quite understand, to, to an extent, agree with Councillor Bartlett's concerns over the change from an arms length company to in-house model, and the particularly the annual revenue cost of that, that in-house directorate, um, when you have such sort of difficult financial decisions to make. Um, but let's be really clear, regeneration isn't something, well, should we really be spending money on doing it or should we not? Regeneration is really important for BCP, you know, we have some really important sites that we need, move, need to move forward. It's not just for the, for the council, it's actually for the future of our businesses and our communities and the people in BCP to actually deliver the homes that we need and deliver the sort of new spaces and, and new places that, that we need across across the conurbation. Um, so it's really important that, that we do actually fund and push forward with regeneration but it needs to be really focused on schemes which can progress and really deliver for the, the people businesses of, of Paul and Bournemouth and Christchurch um, I, I quite agree with Councillor Hadley he's right very right about the Holes Bay site which you know, we were promised 10 to 15 years ago would fund the Twin Sales Bridge and you know, it's going to be developed and all the sill money from that would fund across the, the council, Paul Council then and put it to the Twin Sales Bridge but that, that never happened and those promises just Fell, fell through. Um, I suppose what I've really been pleased with about this is that the decision-making approach that we've taken to this has been really sort of quite detailed, it's been informed, it's been consultative, it's, it's been open and transparent, it's allowed sort of overview and scrutiny to consider the, the facts and the figures. There's been so many sort of discussions in the, in the background and conversations and, and input, you know, positive input from future places to help, help with the decision. So I think rather than just, you know, a few people 
deciding, well, I don't like the sound of that, you know, we're going to chop this or we're going to do this this way. It's not been that at all. It's been everybody, I think, has gone into it with an open mind and really sort of considered the, the, the details of this and, and what's best. So I think we've done the best we possibly can in terms of the decision making process. And I think the option that's proposed in front of us is the best. It's got concerns, you know, it's got costs to us. But um, the regeneration is something we really do need to fund and do need to get on with. And I'm happy to support the proposal in front of us. Thanks, Councillor Brown. Councillor Cox online. Hey, Leader. Um, I'll try and get through this. <laughs> um, I just wanted to emphasise uh, what uh, Councillor Hadley had uh, mentioned about transparency, which I thought was very relevant. Councillor Cox, um, I know you're not very well. Is there any chance you could speak up a little? Sorry. I know that's tough. Yeah, I'll do my best. Um, I just wanted to emphasise um, what Councillor Hadley had said about transparency. Um, I feel that the changing of the model uh, halfway through um, was wrong, fundamentally wrong. Uh, and it, what it ended up doing was just masking costs uh, to the council, which we're now having to pick up. Um, the proposals uh, that have been put forward mean that the costs of regeneration are, are now transparent. Um, and I would emphasise that we are still uh, capitalise what we can, uh, which we will we will do by we, and we will do it to reduce the burden on the general fund as much as possible. Uh, I believe the uh, approach we've taken is honest. Um, we are committed to regeneration, but regeneration that we can afford. Um, I think the alternative approach would be to involve uh, in writing, just writing off loans every now and again, which is neither transparent nor honest. So I would uh, certainly recommend the um, the proposals to Cabinet. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Cox. Sorry, I know Councillor Martin was supposed to be next. Councillor Martin, then Councillor Wilson. Uh, thank you, Leader. Um, Obviously, I'm very happy to support these recommendations and um, echo what uh, uh, Councillor Brown has just said about the, the work that's gone into um, uh, where we are today, basically. I'd just like to make a couple of quick points, um, and I think that's really about reputation and lessons to be learned. Um, I, I think it's very evident that significant reputational damage is attached to this council because of how Future Places was set up in the first place and the way it operated. Um, the political involvement of the last administration from the outside and from the outset was, I think, central to a sort of damaging context and relentless adverse publicity around Future Places. Um, irrespective of the, of the sector expertise that, that was brought in, and I have no quarrel with any of that, really. Um, this political dimension did taint future places, uh, and I think it sort of pretty much destroyed any credibility that it that it that it had, or just certainly damaged it to a large degree. And just to quote the the governance review, uh, members were too involved in the operational management and in commissioning activity. That is not that was not their role, and that should not have happened. Um, we've obviously heard things today that. that still do not obviously sit comfortably with us uh, as a and residents, but we'll move on from that. Um, the other point I would make is, and some of these words have already been used, I mean, again, accepting considerable expertise in the company, but the list of issues that have uh, arisen in the last two, in the two, three years are, are quite staggering, really. The costs, in some cases, the recruitment, and there has to be a question mark over some of the recruitment, the lack of accountability and transparency, the governance, the mission creep that you've referred to previously, leader, the lack of focus, the lack of trust, poor relationships and tensions between the council and its own arms length company, and something referred to earlier on about the um, get, being able to get hold of the work that the taxpayer has paid for, and of course the the the, the, the amount of the, the pace and the amount of money that's been burned through. Um, I'd also question, in some cases, the quality of the work, and I, I, I mentioned the Christchurch Civic Offices uh, in that context. Um, I hope we can take it as read that lessons will be learned from the, all that, a lot of those issues uh, and that how this model was, in, was flawed. It isn't just not appropriate now because things have moved on. I think it was, it was fundamentally flawed at the, at the very beginning. Um, 
my final point really is about consultants. Uh, I'm aware of three individuals in the local area, uh, experts in their field, who had been approached by consultants who, not from this area, lived in different parts of the country, um, who contacted them to ask them for their, their knowledge, their expertise and their information uh, about the local area so that they could incorporate that into their consultancy reports to future places. To me, that's just part of a consultancy sector gravy train. And I think there's some real lessons to be learned from that. In, that in future, we need to remember that the people with the expertise and the knowledge and the passion and the vision for our area actually mainly are people who are here. Um, we don't need other people, other consultants charging big fees to ask our people what they what 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 they should do, and then and then uh, use essentially ideas that, that are here already. And I think um, you know whatever we do in future in any sector of the council, let's not get caught up in the in the consultation circus, as I call it. Thank you, leader. Thank, thanks, Councillor Martin. I think you know it's fair to say that. Uh, there is a role for consultants when we have no capacity. I think the general assumption and belief of the public was that the creation of future places was to try and reduce the reliance on con external consultants because we were effectively buying the best of the bunch. Um, so I think that's what's stuck in people's throats a little bit is that, that the best of the bunch were then consulting with other people um, and I think the other the other point, which was raised earlier in the question that we had about the the offices, um, is we've got plenty of space within this building. We always did have, and perhaps if the people who were working on the future places projects um, had embedded themselves in the space that's dedicated to operations within the building and forged really strong relationships with the officers that that trust would have been built and the um, the mission creep might have been tem tempered a little. Um, so I think, you know, it's symptomatic really, isn't it? Going off and finding your own offices rather than staying within the council when there was space in the council is symptomatic of an organisation that perhaps, you know, didn't want to be inside the council. And I really hope that um, the majority of the staff, if not all of them, um, realise that the best uh, that, that we have offering them something really good and to be able to deliver on some of those really exciting projects that, that they wanted to get involved with. Councillor Wilson. Yeah, I'm just going to keep this brief because I think uh, Councillor Hadley and um, Councillor Bartlett have kind of what I, what I wanted to say, really. Um, but I, I, I mean, I share the, 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 some of the concerns, but hopefully um, the, the merging of the um, in-house delivery team and um, the external expertise will, will hopefully complement each other. I think it's like hopefully a strength-based um, approach. Um, I mean, for, for my part, um, the local um, the housing delivery team are fantastic. Um, that in in 2019 when I first took over. Um, I've come back into this role and there's a lot of different faces but within the housing delivery team there's a lot of familiar faces because they've all been here they've got local knowledge um i just think that um we need to get the structure right and we need to get the capacity right of of um any any team so um yeah I'm, but at the end of the day we do need to get um houses delivered and we need to get these re regeneration sites up and running um so i just want to add that in thank you councillor hannah Thank you. I will also be brief, uh, but it's first of all to appreciate all the work that uh, has gone into the report and to the discussions prior to the report uh, and into the review by overview and scrutiny. Uh, the one comment that I wanted to make, uh, a lot has already been said, is in relation to the suggestion that we might delay six months and uh, review again at that stage. And it does seem to me that we have had four options set out in the report uh, which have been pretty thoroughly analysed uh, that there are key issues in terms of the financial implications of each uh, and the key issues of transparency and control that have already been referred to uh, by various colleagues. Uh, I can see no real benefit in delay. Uh, one of the options, the one that is recommended to us, has been clearly recommended and the others rejected. 
difficult decision, yes, but I think it is time to bite the bullet and make the decision. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hannah. So, um, if there's no more discussion on that, can I suggest that we vote on that and then separately talk to the other part? So, all those in favour of A to G proceeding as per the paper? That's unanimous. Obviously, Councillor Cox isn't allowed to vote, so all those of us that are here have voted in favour. Thank you, colleagues. Um, so I'm going to now go back to item H, uh, which is the element that uh, would be a council decision, which in the paper says it's recommended that it approves, that we approve, we, that Cabinet recommends that Council approve the disposal of the former civic offices in Paul and Christ terms to be approved by the Chief Financial Officer, also acting in his capacity as Corporate Property Officer in consultation with the Portfolio Holder for Finance. There was a very robust discussion about this um, at um, the, the scrutiny um, and during scrutiny um, I indicated that that I felt that given that the focus of the officers had been really constrained in terms of the future of future places that I would have liked to see more interrogation around this element about whether we could sell or whether we should lease, or what the, whether there would be any restrictions around how we would expect the, the buildings to be used, uh, and also an element around recognising what this might mean for the vertical slice, um, which is the area of, of the Port Civic Centre in which the historic element uh, exists. So the, the formal, the, the, the Mayor's Parlour, the Chamber, um, the, you know, the, the and the various bits that are, are key listed areas. Um, there was a recommendation from Cabinet, so I, uh, from uh, Committee, so I'm going to pass over to Councillor Bartlett to talk to that, to tell us what the recommendation is and to expand on it. Then I'm going to bring in Councillor Canavan for his thoughts, and then I'm going to open it up to Cabinet um, with a potential alternative recommendation, which um, on the night I said I would be content with. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, um, this was uh, this was part of the main paper, and I think the ONS felt that that, that this needed a bit more uh, work. And the reason, the main reason for that was that the future of the uh, Paul Civic Centre was debated uh, in depth uh, many, many months ago, and actually it went. The decision uh, went to full council, and the, the decision was to allow this vertical slice, if you like, in the, to be retained for civic use and also for use of the coroner's court. And that was a decision taken by full council. Uh, work actually started on, on that and it was then suddenly brought to a halt because there was a change in strategy for that particular building. Some new ideas uh, came out um, and I, I believe uh, it then went to future places to develop those ideas and uh, business cases were brought forward. Um, so I think with that history uh, and then being confronted with a very stark, shall we now sell it, uh, and also the same applied to Christchurch as well to, to a degree, um, you know, shall we just sell them? And I, I think ONS were a bit uneasy that uh, the issues that were raised previously about selling it had not fully been addressed and therefore uh, in order to give the councillors, particularly local councillors in those particular wards, uh, the opportunity to review, um, you know, the future of those uh, facilities, that that, that, should, that should happen. Uh, because if the decision was made immediately without debate, then that was likely to cause a few problems locally in particular. And so it, the, the, the committee believed that um, they should really, you know, this decision should be put on hold for just a while to, to review what the options actually are, rather than sort of rush in and make this decision uh, uh, probably a bit too quickly. So the recommendation that came, came out uh, against uh, Recommendation H was, uh, as outlined in the report for uh, recommendation to council to be deferred by cabinet to enable further work to be undertaken on the subject to the future of the civic offices in Paul and Christchurch 
This deferral is recommended to enable all councillors to fully understand the options for the civic offices, particularly around leasehold and freehold options, and to address issues around that part of the former Paul Civic Centre known as the Vertical Slice, whilst recognising that there is a need to progress the whole issue as quickly as possible. Thank you, Leader. Thank you, Councillor Bartlett. Councillor Canavan, can I bring you in at this point, please? I've probably got not, nothing further to add other than to fully support what uh, Councillor Bartlett has, has just said. I think it was a very uh, a very good discussion at ONS and I think that recommendation is absolutely right. So thank you. Thank you. And it does show that, you know, a view and scrutiny's purpose is to add value. And I think in this case, there's really clear evidence that this adds value to the work of Cabinet and has allowed us to pause and say, oh, yeah, actually, you got a really good point here. So, um, so yeah, Mike Cox, you have your hand up. I did, Leader. Um, it was um, just to emphasise that um, we do require the sale proceeds for these uh, as part of transformation. So um, I wouldn't want to see any significant delay caused by this deferral. Um, I don't believe, I, I, from what I've heard, I understand the, the problems in connection with the the pool civic centre vertical slice, I think you called it, um, but I haven't had any arguments, I haven't heard any arguments about why we shouldn't sell the Christchurch civic centre. Um, so maybe we can split those two up. It's just a just a, an idea. Thanks, Councillor Cox. I think you're correct in that the issues around Christchurch were more around uh, future places ideas that were um, didn't seem to take account of the flooding issues um, in in their proposal. Um, but I think you're actually correct. I don't think that there was a um, a desire to not sell. Uh, Christchurch. I don't also think that this recommendation suggests that we aren't going to sell Paul. I think what it's suggesting is that actually we need to analyse the options properly. Um, personally, I, I, some of us who go back a little way in Paul will remember that when we made the decision to sell a piece of land uh, in Paul by the uh, roundabout where the fire station is, um, we had suggested that that should be sold leasehold and not freehold so that we could actually secure the jobs that were promised from the people that were due to buy it. Uh, it was sold freehold against our recommendation. Uh, Councillor Brown is smiling because he remembers it well. Um, it was sold and uh, shortly afterwards we had a, um, a petrol station built on the site that was supposed to deliver quite a large number of jobs. Now, as it transpires, that site now also has a, um, a coffee shop on it and another building on it, and it probably will deliver a significant number of jobs over time. But it does demonstrate how if we had kept the leasehold, we might have had a little more control over what happened to that site. And I think there was a very good argument made, particularly I think Councillor Moore was involved with reflecting on that, that we need to look at the options properly. I don't think there is a consensus even in Cabinet about the vertical slice, um, but I do think it's right that we pause so that we can have that debate properly. So Councillor Hadley, I think it's actually in your ward. Uh, it's not actually, it's in Parks oh, Ward. Just it? outside just your outside ward, my ward, sorry. But uh, um, yeah, I, I guess I mean, it, it's, it's interesting, isn't it? I, I do. Uh, um, I, I, and it does tie to what Councillor Cox has just said. We we, we do have a, um, a, a need to uh, realise uh, the capital. It's been sitting there idle. And as, as um, uh, Adam Richens said in o Obion Scrutiny Committee, uh, um, every day that we sit on it, it costs us money because we've got to uh, provide security and some, some degree of, uh, of heating for the building. Um, and and uh, uh, some of the elements that were raised, Councillor Aikenhead raised in Ovian scrutiny concerns about the information not being there. And then she quoted from the 
Future Places Outline Business Case, which did contain some of the answers to some of the questions she raised. Uh, um, and also um, the Confidential Annex 5, which I'm not going to go into, uh, um, does go into quite some detail about it. So I think you know, there, is, there is evidence there uh, um, to support um, um, the decision. I think the bit about it being historic is kind of interesting because the history of, of Paul goes back to the 1200s. Um, and of course, we still own the Guildhall, which was the historic uh, um, uh, town, town hall and is, is now used for the, the, uh, um, the, the Charter Trustees uh, in Poole. Um, the, the, uh, um, the, the Pool Civic Centre goes back to the 1920s. So uh, not so long ago, but beyond all of our memory, uh, um, there was a dislocation and a move there. Uh, we could create a, a mayor's parlour either somewhere in the Guildhall or in another building without blighting uh, um, this, this building. And I think there is something in, in our analysis, and I, I recognise you know, the, the need to, for a, a short deferral, but we should be looking at, is the vertical size actually the right thing to do? In terms of what constraints that creates on the building, um, the the hope with a, a luxury hotel was that the the, the chamber and and you know the, and the mayor's parlour would be rooms that might be available to the public to view, and they are lovely. You know they are they they do have merit, uh, and we do also have uh, um, the, um, the 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 the, uh, um, the the heritage uh, protection of parts of the building. Um, but that doesn't mean that we have to own it. We have to uh, tie ourselves to it. I think more important is that the mayor has somewhere sensible for, for his function, uh, his or her function, I should say, and uh, um, uh, and that we we move forward sensibly uh, uh, with it. Um, so I'd be keen on on the, the the deferral being as short as possible. But I think the other thing was that, that you know, this was about giving officers the mandate to go and look at this seriously and not to waste their time on something that we then subsequently do. So I'd be really keen that we have that debate amongst councillors about do we or do we not want to use uh, um, the civic parts of of that civic centre, or do we recognise there are other buildings that we could work out of uh, um, and and uh, and give a steer that allows the officers to get on and get rid of these sites uh, um, uh, in a sensible fashion. Um, and, I, and I agree in terms of leasehold rather than freehold. It's fascinating when you look at uh, um, Lord uh, Merrick's uh, um, ownership of, of parts of the, the area that, uh, um, that go back uh, um, a very long way, and he still has some control over uh, what happens uh, on, on, it, on, on, on those buildings. Um, and I think you know the council ought to be looking potentially at um, short or long leasehold uh, um, to be able to exercise some control. And Hopefully, the protection also covers that. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Hadley. Can I just clarify uh, with either Ingrid or Graham? I don't mind who. Um, if if we make, um, how can we? How can we progress a, a request from Cabinet so to to accept the recommendation to um, to defer that decision on H, but make a request? for an assessment of the options um, be done by officers to bring it back to full council um, very early in the new year, I think it's probably realistic because um, am I right in thinking that we don't need, if we were to sell these assets, we don't need them to go through within this financial year. The expectation is for the financial year 24-25, so it needs to be short to give us time to deliver on that. So wh what is the governance process for us asking for that to happen? Well, we bring a report back to full council and we could, of course, have another o special overview and scrutiny to consider it so all members have the opportunity for that fuller scrutiny. And of course, now that we have overview and scrutiny board back, they're now meeting on a monthly basis, so we shouldn't need a special one because it should be able to be scheduled rather than have to, to be convened. So there's no reason why we couldn't accept this recommendation and put onto the forward plan within a fairly short space of time that piece of work. Graham? Yep. Yes, thanks, Lady. Yeah, just to confirm that I think that's right. In terms of the, the time scale to, to do a sale, anyway, we were talking about that this morning. We think that's likely to take about a year anyway in terms of the process for that. So. The final decision would, would be at that point. Um, my sense is, is we can craft a wording for you now that just asks for, for what you want. I would bring it back. I, I suggest it comes back to Cabinet, although the decision will then go on to Council. Yeah, but if we if we minute that it comes back to Cabinet early in the new year, and it's just, I, I'm just not sure whether we could, you know, which meeting we would make. So if we do it as early in 2024, that'd be fine. And then the question from is whether we separate out Christchurch civic offices from Paul Civic Centre in that process. I don't think you need to do that in the recommendation. You just need to say to bring them back, but we wouldn't bring them back as one. We can bring them back separately then. So 
accept the recommendation. I've got you, Jeff. I'm going to come back to you next. Accept the recommendation. Can we get the Christchurch one through, which is a, a, a less controversial one? I don't think there's anyone crying out for a vertical slice of, uh, of, of, the, of the building there. Because if that is able to be released much more quickly with a potential sale to secure some money in the bank for that one, I would rather that we didn't delay to bring them forward in the same paper if we can deliver something um, within that 24-25. Before Adam, uh, Graham is nodding. Adam, can you just clarify how you would feel about that? Yeah, <clears throat> yeah thank you, Leader. Um, you know, and I'm not going to disagree with the proposed approach that you actually um, have suggested as to the way forward, but just to highlight, there is a cross-party working group that look at asset sales, um, and that group um, identified a number of assets to come forward, um, you know, and in there was a significant income-generating asset. Um, but that significant income-generating asset didn't eventually go forward for approval because we knew that there was potential for all these alternative assets um, to potentially come forward instead. Um, and therefore, the assumption was you know, that income generating asset would have been deferred into 24-25 um, as part of due process. Now, clearly, if we are not going to bring forward some of these other assets, then we're going to have to carefully look at where does that leave the overall funding of the transformation programme in this year. At this moment in time, I think as long as we're prepared to accept there might be an element of risk around some of that, then actually um, OK with regards to the recommendation to put forward. Because, you know, we knew that it's going to be a little bit tight, but it should be manageable. But it would be fair to say that if we were to take this, if we were to, well, let's, let's make the assumption that uh, we went with the original recommendation and we agreed it today, it would yeah. then have to go to full council next week. Yeah. It may not get through full council. Let's be realistic. Yeah. It's a democratic process. People might say, I'm not having that. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. which case, <laughs> technical term, I'm not having that. Um, you have actually then only got six months to complete a sale with no light purchaser lined up. So the chances of it happening in yeah. this financial year are low anyway. So from the point of view of risk, I, I can't see there being a significantly higher risk yeah. of not if we're looking for a delivery in the next year. Ingrid, did you want to add anything? You look like you were poised over your... No, just to say one of my colleagues um, has just emailed me to say that actually estates are working on, 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 on the other report now. So there shouldn't be any delay. So we that's really good news. OK, so with all that in mind, Councillor Hannah. Uh, thank you. Uh, discussion has moved on a little since I first indicated. Feel free to go back. Uh, but, but I was uh, picking up on Councillor Cox's comments about uh, the rationale for the sales and the need to uh, provide funding for transformation, which makes me feel a little guilty, that being my portfolio. Uh, but it did occur to me, given his comments as well, that uh, Christchurch does not seem to be such an issue as to whether we might approve Christchurch now at this cabinet meeting uh, and simply defer a pool. But I'm also uh, conscious of the fact that that might complicate things in terms of what goes to full council at what time. Uh, so I simply lay that as a possibility for further discussion. Thank you. I take that point, although we, there are still op opportunities for us to look at the options between leasehold and freehold, even within the Civic Centre in Christchurch, which may deliver us a better option. Councillor Martin, did you have a view on that? And my instinct is to is to defer this in its entirety under following the recommendation of scrutiny, um, but to separate out the how quickly the two come back so that we get a quick delivery time on, on Christchurch. But I'm happy to take your thoughts as one of the two councillors that are from Christchurch. Councillor Cox, if you'd like to stand by for any thoughts on that. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Leader. Um, just, just to... Uh to re reiterate what you'd said, that there isn't any sentimentality uh, um, attached to the Civic Centre site, as far as I'm concerned, in Christchurch. So um, I would support deferring this so we can look at all the options. Um, what I would say, uh, and I was reminded 
about this because you used the phrase, we're not having this, and which reminded me of a Christchurch independent councillor who was always saying, I'm not having it. And I think you know who we're talking about. Um, and I never lose any opportunity to talk about capital spending in Christchurch. Obviously, this is all destined to go into Mr. Richard's pot for transformation. But there might be some robust debate about whether any of that capital receipt might be spent in Christchurch. But um, I think we know where it's destined at the end of the day. But I just thought I'd make that point. Thank you. I think the truth is, if we don't transform, there isn't going to be any capital spend anywhere. But if we can do the transformation, then we can obviously all be very clear that Christchurch needs its fair and appropriate slice of the uh, of the capital cake. Um, if you'd like to make us a list of what you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> Councillor Cox and then Councillor Brown. Um, I'm not quite sure what your question was. Um, it was to do with... I was the... asking the question about, um, do you, are you comfortable with us talking about Paul and Christchurch separately. Um, Councillor Hannah was suggesting that we should continue with the proposal to go to Christchurch, sell Christchurch now at, with a decision to full council next week, rather than actually being clear about the options in a bit more considered paper. I think we should go uh, and sell Christchurch now and go along with what Councillor Hannah has suggested. Councillor Brown. Thank you, Leader. Yeah, um, <clears throat> interesting discussion. Um, I, 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 again, I, I, I listened into the um, overview and scrutiny committee and the interesting discussion there. For me, we need to get on with some, something. We need to get on with the decision due to the ongoing utility, security, insurance costs, which have to be met every month with no benefit to residents or council taxpayers. Um, that said, I'm, I'm not convinced about the vertical slicing pool. You know, it's, interested to have more discussions on it over time but um, I, yeah but I, I think I'd probably agree with Councillor Hedby a, li a little on that. Um, it's interesting reading the report that by selling these sites you know we're going ahead with the recommendation we do avoid the sort of longer term development and investment risks and I, and I believe in our financial position we need to do that but it also talks about the council losing direct control of the place shaping of these sites and I think that's what is important and is with, worth pausing and thinking about a bit more because we need to look at the legal mechanisms to protect the council's interests and to ensure some kind of control over the future use of these sites um, just to ensure that they are as beneficial as they can be for the area and, I, and I'm, I'm glad actually the leader brought up about the um, Creekmore site by the Holes Bay roundabout because that really did remind me about exactly this kind of situation where a decision again a lot of us argued against the decision, but it was voted through at the time to take a cash payment for the, for the land. I always remember the front page of the Echo had a lovely picture of an iconic office building which the bidders said they would build on that site and deliver 300 jobs for the area. And we've ended up with a petrol station and a coffee drive through. Um, and none of that, it was all just smoke and mirrors. It was just wasn't going to happen. And but we were promised 300 jobs and we've not got that. So. For me, you know, that site could have delivered some really good sort of, you know, business startup units. Or, or there's all sorts of things that could be more beneficial for the area. So, in light of that, I think it is worth us pausing on these just to make sure that we've got the right legal position, right legal mechanisms to make sure that we can actually shape what happens on those sites and not look back in five years' time and regret the fact that they've gone and you know we've got something we didn't particularly want or or desire so it is worth a short pause but yeah that said um, we do need to get on with something to, to avoid the, the constant running costs and, and just a very quick comment about I understand Councillor Martin's point about Mr Richardson's transformation plot I think he probably say it's not his transformation plot it's the council's transformation program so um, yeah <laughs> thanks Councillor Brown do before I bring Councillor Hannah back in do I need a form of words um, in order to instruct on that as an additional recommendation that sits within the cabinet's decisions as opposed to the full council's decision? So, uh, uh, do you see what I mean? Because we've agreed A to G, H sits to full council, which at this point looks as though we're going to defer, but obviously we need a G.1. <laughs> But if it's H, then it sits under cabinet recommends to council, which cabinet isn't going to recommend to council because it's cabinet decision to actually um, ask for a piece of work to be done. Or does that even need to be a decision of cabinet? 
think it could be a, a dis- think it could be a decision of the cabinet to ask for that further work for it to come back, and that way you've got a formal record of that. The question for me is, if you want to take Christchurch to full council, then it needs a variation to H, such that it separates Christchurch from Paul. We would. You know, normally we would prepare a separate report then on that item, but if we are going to hold a council meeting next week, I think the deadline for the reports is five o'clock tonight. So we're going to struggle to do that. Um, so let's yeah. so okay. So let's just take this back a stage. Ca- informally, let's 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 resolve this problem. Councillor Hannah, you suggested that we go ahead with Christchurch now. Go ahead. Uh, I did indeed suggest that, and I heard Councillor Cox uh, endorsing uh, fairly strongly uh, if that could be done. But I'm also conscious of the uh, need to refer to or to bring it to Council. Uh, I just overheard exactly what I was going to suggest uh, coming from Jess, that perhaps instead of it coming to the 5th of October Council, it could come to the November Council. Uh, that means instead of being delayed by three to four months, it would be delayed by only a further one month. Uh, and officers could then progress in that. So I suppose my question on that is, does that give the opportunity for scrutiny to consider that if they wish? Now, I'm going I'm to be a bit controversial here and say that... Scrutiny doesn't have to consider everything. And we made a commitment that just because it shadows um, Cabinet, it, it, it has the right to scrutinise everything that goes to Cabinet and Council, but has no need to. So I suppose if it's a fairly uncontroversial matter of the disposal of Christchurch, which is coming to full Council that everybody would have a vote on, there wouldn't we wouldn't need to factor in, oh, but does that disable scrutiny. So can I go back to Councillor Bartlett for his thoughts on, you know, I don't want to, to be accused of dodging scrutiny if we were to take just that. You would never say that, but certain members might. Thank you, Leader. All, all I would say is, of course, the ONS board it will be is independent of the Cabinet and it will take its own decisions on what goes on its agenda. And at the moment, I've not really considered when or where this might appear, if indeed we felt it was necessary to go through. But I would say that, you know, both of these business cases have been considered previously uh, when they were presented under Future Places by ONS. And I do recall a very vigorous debate about whether they should be sold or not. Um, So um, I'm, I'm not sure necessarily that we would add value here. Uh, given the history, and it's already been through ONS, and it's been debated several times before, and it, it seems to me that it's a, a decision for Cabinet, and 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 because of the timescales involved in particular, I would I would say um, I would say uh, Councillor Martin's perspective on Christchurch, although it seems an easy option, there is still the issue about who retains ownership in the longer term, and you know there is also Christchurch Town Council to consider as well. Uh, who always have a view, uh, so we need to, we we need to remember that there are local interests that need to be considered, and and I, I personally I don't see any reason why these can't be considered together, but as quickly as possible and brought forward to my full council as quickly as possible, given the the need for uh, accelerating the time as fast as we possibly can. But I suppose the where we where we sit today is that Christchurch Town Council nor the public of Christchurch would have any any opportunity because it's due to come to council next week for a decision. What I think we're we're looking at is could it come, could Christchurch come to the November full council uh, with um, a paper which actually does include the option around whether a leasehold is better. That does then give Christchurch town council the opportunity, should they wish, to actually look at it on their agenda and to make a, a contribution at full council um, at that time. Does that make sense, Graham? Thank you, Lady. Yes, my, my suggestion is that we can um, adopt 
the recommendation from overview and scrutiny, which is to defer to enable further work to be carried out. We could then bring the report on Christchurch civic offices alone to the cabinet meeting in late October. Uh, that's on the 25th of October, which will allow us then to make a recommendation from Cabinet, a formal recommendation onto the Council meeting in early November. And we can spend a bit more time on Paul, because I think there is more discussion with councillors that's needed on Paul to get the configuration right and a decision about the Guildhall and, and that all in, in place. And therefore, it may be that Paul comes back separately in January or February. But that feels to me that would allow members to make a, a considered decision about Christchurch in isolation and then spend more time considering the decision on Paul uh, and bring that back in in early 2024, if that's helpful. And that complies entirely, I think, with the recommendation from overview and scrutiny and enables the Cabinet to be seen to be making a decision and presenting that to Council. I'm getting a lot of nods. I still have Councillor Hadley who would like to speak. Does anybody else want to speak on this or shall we take Councillor Hadley and then make a decision? Councillor Hadley. Thank you. It's just two, two very simple points. Uh, um, I, I listened to the ONS debate and, and Christchurch didn't get covered in, un, under, under the discussion around H previously. So I think you know they did consider it last last week. And, and obviously, as, as uh, Councillor Barton says, they have the opportunity to consider what they choose to. But I think they did talk about it. The other thing just mentioned, we didn't talk about the coroner's court in terms of Paul. And that, that, again, was part of the complexities around whether or not we kept the vertical slice. Um, so again, that might be part of a good reason to separate the two so we don't get Christchurch ensnared in further discussion. I agree. Did anybody else wish to say, Councillor Martin, did you want to come back on it? No, I'm, I'm happy to support uh, the compromise that's been suggested by the Chief Exec. Thank you. OK, so the so the so the proposal around H is that we fully adopt the recommendation that's come from overview and scrutiny, which defers that decision at this point but that we progress on a twin track approach with Christchurch coming back through Cabinet next month, which is obviously tight, but it's doable, uh, to be considered at full council in November. And hopefully um, we can get an update on, on the timeline for Paul, which will just follow a few months later. Yeah, OK. So... Uh, on that basis, can I take a vote? All those in favour with that proposal? That is unanimous. Thank you, everybody. Whew. So, what's next? Uh, okay, so the next item on the agenda um, relates to our customer contact centre. So, agenda item eight, to agree the provision of revenue funding for the delivery of a contact sender as a solution, CCAS. This is going to be presented by Councillor Martin. Do you have a second to Councillor Martin? I do. Councillor Hannah? Thank you very much. So, Councillor Martin, if you'd like to present it and then we'll take it uh, in the usual way through members and then back to Cabinet. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, I'm uh, actually presenting this on, on behalf of myself and Councillor Hannah, who, who may want to make some remarks later. Uh, this is part of our ongoing programme to deliver a better, more efficient service to our customers, which is clearly part of, part of getting back to basics that we talked about six months ago and continue to talk about. Um, as the report notes, the current Teams-based system, Teams system is budgeted from transformation and COVID grants back in 2020. We now have the opportunity for a break clause in that contract. Um, that contract hasn't been particularly successful. Um, there's been poor service and uh, failures in the, and service level breaches. So the team has looked at a number of different options. Um, and the chosen solution gives more flexibility, better queue management, improved functionality, which I hate that word, but improved functionality and a range of other channels for communication. Uh, these include email, web chat, social media platforms, and SMS. I can go into more detail about those if, if you wish uh, later. Um, I should stress that not all these additional uh, platforms uh, and channels will come on stream straight away. Uh, there will be a second phase once we've got the telephony system um, embedded. Customers should see uh, a much better service with reduced call queuing, fewer dropout, call, call, call dropouts, more service options I've just outlined, 
uh, and more of our vulnerable customers able to get through and be helped, uh, which obviously clearly is a big frustration at the, at the moment. Uh, that not enough of our customers are, are being served quickly. Uh, there is uh, an annual cost saving of £33,000 on the existing system. So uh, we're asking Cabinet to agree 169000 per annum uh, from 24-25 onwards. That's not currently covered in the general fund-based revenue budget. Uh, this, of course, is outside of the normal budget process. And I, and I can confirm that, that Mr. Richards has been involved in and, and consulted and talked to him about the you know, involved in the implications of this, so he's um, not, sure, not sure that he's happy, but uh, he, he, he knows the score. Uh, even if we had stayed with the existing provider, uh, we would have needed new funding as the funding for the initial contract is, uh, runs out. Um, so uh, I would just add that the contact centre, I mean, obviously there are a number of options that are in there in the paper, one of which is not, is, is not to continue with the contact centre, but the contact centre is a core component of BCP's digital future and a vital front door for our customers. Um, this system is not a magic bullet um, because uh, it's like the wider transformation, it's a work in progress, but we are confident, I think we're confident, Jeff, that, uh, that we will see a significant difference in our customer service. Uh, this is as much about replacing the current telephony system as it is about transformation itself. And the, the new telephony system is basically uh, one of the building blocks for a better efficiency and better customer service, better customer service. That's it for me. Thanks, Councillor Martin. Councillor Hannah, did you want to, um, to add to that before I um, take it to a debate? Uh, thank you, just a brief comment. Uh, yes, I'm very happy to second the report. Uh, I'm looking forward to the new contact centre coming into use. I think we will all be very aware as ward councillors uh, discussing with residents uh, that uh, residents have experienced difficulties in contacting the council and it's something that uh, regularly appears in Facebook comments, in comments, in letters to the Echo, etc. Uh, and there's a reputational uh, difficulty that we've had in the past which I hope that this will help to address. Uh, so I look forward to a rather better service for residents right across the area and uh, hope that uh, this will receive support from Cabinet. Thank you. So before I have a question that I'm going to ask in a minute, but uh, before I do, are there any other members who wish to speak? So we only have Councillor Canavan and Councillor Bartlett uh, at the meeting. Councillor Bartlett shaking his head. Councillor Canavan hasn't turned off his mic, so I'm assuming that that's a no. I'm going to fill for a few seconds, give him the chance. Um, my question then, pending him not asking a question, um, is why is it that the previous budget didn't assume that we would have any costs for a telephony service going forward? I'm, I'm a bit shocked about why I understand that the contract's coming to an end, but surely there was an assumption in the in the MTFP that we would be spending money from somewhere. I find that quite surprising. So Bartlett's now decided he does want to speak after all. Can I let's see if we can get an answer to that, whether it be and I, I fully understand that neither Councillor Martin nor Councillor Hannah were involved in the previous budget setting programmes. Pro so I wonder whether Adam Richards is able to answer that question. But before he does, Councillor Bartlett, you clearly had a... Can, do you want to elaborate on that same point? I'm going to allow it on this occasion. So do you want to just elaborate on that and then that will give Adam time to come up with an answer? Yeah, thank you, Leela. Yeah, my age, I'm afraid, sometimes plays against me and... Uh... I had a senior moment there when I got to ask the question I'd intended to. Um, but yeah, it, when I read this paper, it was it was very much uh, the call centre issue is of great importance to residents, hugely important. And I was delighted to see there was a recognition that the current system is going to be replaced. Uh, I, you know, I was really, I was ecstatic when I could see that what it was going to be able to do for us. But at the same time, I then thought, well, surely this is something we're doing under transformation anyway. What, so why isn't it all in the transformation budget? What, why isn't it been included in it? And why are we having to ask extra money at this point uh, 
to, um, to, to fund what is an obvious requirement. And, you know, I, I, you know that's, the, that's the question. Why, why isn't it already allowed for in the in transformation budget? Thank you, Lady. Uh, obviously, we've only just taken this over. So you can imagine our shock at the same thing, Councillor Bartlett. It seems utterly crazy. Um, Adam, did, do you have an answer to that question? Because I don't think I can answer it, and I'm not sure that Councillor Hannah can. I do have an answer, but I'm not too sure it's an answer that people want to hear. But nevertheless, um, what we can remember is that this piece of software, I think, was put in um, in a response to COVID in 2019. So there was an incredible amount of um, work that had to be done during that period um, to support our community. Um, but at the time, you know, it was recognised that you know, this funding would be from the Transformation Programme for a period of, year, uh, of a couple of years, up until and including this financial year, 23, 24. The issue then came is actually uh, from 24, 25, and you know, there wasn't an identified source of funding for the program from that point in time. Now, you know, we can debate, you know, um, the previous medium term financial plan and the robustness and whether or not that should or should have included this item, but the, the facts were they didn't, and therefore, um, this paper corrects that going forward. Thanks for clarifying that. Councillor Hadley, uh, not Councillor Hadley, Councillor Hannah. Uh, yes, thank you, first of all, to Mr. Hitchens for that clarification. Uh, just to put my own perspective on it, my understanding is that transformation funding is to provide for the process of improving the way in which the council functions, but it cannot provide for the long term revenue costs. Uh, therefore, uh, yes, this was something that I did not anticipate, but uh, having been aware that it was within transformation funding initially, it did not come as a surprise to me that there would be a need for it to come into the revenue budget. Uh, and therefore, uh, I was happy to go with the report in those terms. But it does raise the interesting question, which is whether there are any other items in the transformation budget which will need to be brought into the revenue budget. And perhaps that's something that Mr. Richens might care to advise us of at some point in the future. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Councillor. You make a very good point. You're, you're right. Revenue is not transformation, but this surely should could have been foreseen as something that would be changing. So uh, I'm going to ask Councillor Cox not to speak about it now, because I'm sure he doesn't have the, the, the but to make sure that in his um, in his work with Adam in terms of the medium term financial plan that we don't have any other landmines um, turn up because this does seem a, an obvious thing that should have been in the MTFP going forward. Oh, um, uh, Adam, are you not, not going to warn me of a landmine now, are you? I'm, I'm, I can't help myself, but I'm just going to remind everybody that the, the budget and the medium term financial plan isn't mine and it isn't Councillor Cox's. It is every single person in this room, all officers, all budget holders. So therefore, in constructing that document, we are relying on everybody to identify, you know, if there are issues that need funding to bring them forward so that we can have that debate as to what gets included and what doesn't get included. Thank you. I didn't mean to lay it all at your responsibility. I, I think I meant to lay the responsibility of helping us to see if there was something coming down the line, but I recognise that it's the budget holders that should be able to tell us that information and it's uh, it's a shame that what we didn't know earlier. Councillor Hadley, then Councillor Brown. Thank you, Leader. Um, yeah, I, I think as, as others um, very much welcome the idea that we need to um, update this and give our staff um, the tools to do what is actually quite a difficult job uh, better. Um, but I'm concerned about discontinuity and changeover. Um, and obviously this is being uh, done under GCLAR, which limits it to four years. Uh, and, and my question, I suppose, is, is, is how quickly, and particularly uh, given Cox's 
highlight, sorry, uh, uh, sorry, Councillor Martin highlighted that uh, um, there's a phase one and a phase two. How quickly we get this to, to sing well, to be operationally effective, uh, um, so that we make sure we get value. I think the other bit, and it ties back to you know the, 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 the revenue costs, it's a, a cunning trick that the uh, software suppliers have, uh, have uh, played globally to convert what used to be purchases into ongoing revenue. And funnily enough, the revenue per year seems to be more than it used to cost to buy software and have it in per 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 perpetuity. Um, but uh, um, so so uh, so questions really around how quickly we get we get effective. Have we got breakpoints again if it does does all go wrong or we don't get the value out of it that we hoped for? And have we got clarity about uh, site visits and and ideally, despite it being digital, uh, talking to people in person is often quite more effective in terms of getting the the warts and all the, the problems with a solution rather than a glowing reference uh, um, uh, in terms of making sure that we have got it right this time because clearly we didn't last time um, and, and that may well be because we did it in hurry as part of the COVID response I recognize that um, so uh, so that that's a concern and then also just in terms of the report under item six and seven sustainability and public health um, I think we've kind of overblown it in terms of the idea that uh, um, uh, that, that it's going to be more sustainable because it's in a remote state center. That does change into being somebody else's responsibility, but I'd still be keen that we do query you know, the, the, uh, the, the sustainability of that data centre. Are they uh, using renewable energy? What's their fire suppression? Those sorts of things. It, it doesn't just magically disappear as a, as a you know, I think it says it'll be far more sustainable because it's somebody else's problem effectively. And then on public health, it highlights that it can enhance the wealth, health and well-being of the BC population. Well, I hope it does, but I think, again, that's kind of been over, over, over blowing it. And we need to make sure that we do allow more time for empathetic conversations, as the report says, rather than just cut the staff uh, um, because we, we, you know, in, in order to, to meet our, our bottom line obligations. So if we're freeing up people's time uh, to be able to do things for those, those people who have a particular need, we need to make sure we've still got enough staff to do that. Uh, um, effectively rather than just take the savings and, and uh, the computer says no. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Brown then, Councillor uh, Burton. Sorry. Yeah, thank you, Nita. Um, yeah, it's always difficult with our current financial position. I'm always a bit reluctant to approve additional revenue costs for the coming financial year. Um, but in this case, you know, having read through it, it really does sort of address a lot of the concerns that most of us probably hear from residents that probably most of us have actually experienced trying to call through and get through to the right person to deal with the right issue. Um, it, it, it addresses the, the, what we've said when we took over the administration about getting back to basics and getting the basics right. It, it, it'll deliver better service for residents. It'll deliver more choice about how they contact us and how they sort of report things and, and deal with matters. And what I really hope is that the, from this sort of ongoing revenue costs, it actually by helping us run more efficiently and having less wrongly directed calls, less callbacks, less repeat calls from people who just can't get through to the right person who can get things dealt with. That it's, it's not so tangible, but I'd really anticipate it should save us tens of thousands of pounds of staff time about speaking to the wrong people, or, as well as the time of residents actually wasted queuing or, or getting through to, on the phone or speaking to the wrong people about their issue. Um, so I'd hope that you know there is tens of thousands of benefits in just human resource, um, for want of a better phrase, by, by making this investment. I'm glad Councillor Hadley brought up about the public health implications because I read that. It's possibly stretching it a bit, isn't it? But I think it, it makes a good point about um, it can free up agents to do more with the calls that do come in, especially though from those who are vulnerable, those more complex caseloads, um, and get the sort of day-to-day run-of-the-mill sort of calls dealt with by through other channels or, or more efficiently and effectively with just two or three calls. So um, in some ways reluctantly, but I, I think I would, I'll support the sort of additional sort of revenue cost of this to, to, to deliver on all those things. Thank you. Councillor Burton. Yeah, th thank you, Leader. Um, I, I totally agree that um, we need something that uh, gives a, a better, more streamlined surface here because you, you're totally right. It's one of the things that people talk to me about all the time. Um, ju just uh, my, my questions converge on the technical, so, so I, I'm, I'm not really expecting an answer, but but it's it, it just something that's striking me because at the moment it, we're using a Microsoft Teams based uh, system. Um, we use a Microsoft Team based system, as uh, officers do. Um, is there any integration at the moment between these two systems, and and if it was to change to, to a new, more streamlined, better system, maybe, um, would that cause any issues? 
Oh, does anyone know the answer to that question? I take it that's a no. Um, it's an operational officer level thing. Unfortunately, we don't have the relevant senior officer in the room. Councillor Hadley, are you a professional on this? Because I know you've done data well, transformation in the past. I, I'm, I'm not, and I would defer to the officers that have the knowledge. But I, th I think you know, the, the part of the point is this isn't Teams. The existing system isn't Teams. It was added on. Uh, so initially, as I understood the paper, we had just Teams. And as part of the COVID response, because of the, the, the we can that, that we set up, uh, um, we got this call centre software sitting on top. I'm not sure it necessarily needs to directly link to Teams because obviously if you need to pass a call off to an expert who's just on Teams. That may be a back channel. It may not necessarily. You know, there is something about the end to end process and the, the benefit of being able to track a call right the way through. But I can see there's a good value for integration, but it may be uh, um, asking more than we actually need. But it's a good question. Yeah, as I said, I wasn't really expecting an answer. I, I just wondered if the, the thought had been there. Can I ask a more difficult question then? And I don't know. I almost regret asking this question, but the whole purpose of us is to is to be really clear that we're comfortable with the paper. I have two questions. Uh, one is a sort of curiosity one, and one is a is a slight challenge. Um, if you look at the proposals around the, um, the, the the phase one and phase two, I'm unclear what's in phase one and what's in phase two. The only one that says this will be introduced first is voice. I'm assuming that's in phase one. I'm not sure whether everything else is phase two, but um, and, and forgive my stupidity on uh, on technical things. It's a cloud based system, which presumably means that it can be used in locations other than the actual contact center, because I would like to I've talked a lot about the aspiration for us to have people who are able to work in the community. And if we if we transform some of our the spaces in which people work, can this be accessed by customer contact staff who might be based, for example, in a library rather than in the contact center um, and, and therefore enable us to respond more effectively to peaks and troughs in demand. We know that there's massive increases in demand at, you know, at certain times of the year. And can we draft people in and out according to that? That's my that's my constructive question. My less constructive question, um, which um, I wonder whether Adam might have the answer to is it states in section three, the financial implications, annual fees may be increased annually in accordance with the increase in the retail price index. And yet 24, 25, 25, 26, 26, 27 have no increases in their cost. And I I know Rishi Sunak has promised to get inflation down, but I don't think he promised to get it down to zero within a year. So presumably that unless we have a three year fixed price for the first three years, which we may do, um, I can't see why we've got 169 in the budget each year if it's inflation based. I did warn you. <laughs> I have no idea, but I will find out. Adam seems to have his light on, so I think he knows. Lena, just just to highlight, you know, I think what we can guarantee is is 169 thousand pounds per annum is an absolute bare minimum, and clearly. Um, how much that increases is based on a variable, you know, and that variable is, you know, what is going to happen with regards to the retail price index. So at this moment in time, it's highlighting that, yeah, that bare minimum, um, and as part of a robust medium term financial plan, we will need to ensure that that 169, we make provision for it being higher than that, taking account of what our assumption will be in that plan with regards to the retail price index. So when we write the MTMP, there it is likely that so at this point we're making uh, we're, we're agreeing something based upon what we know yeah but the mtfp that comes forward in february will have the figures that are that the whole budget will be assumed on a, a, a an rpi of whatever and this will therefore likely be a different number in there yeah i think what you'll find is that the the service will reflect on all its contracts um, because this will not be the only contract um, which is um, linked to an inflationary factor. It will um, reflect on all its contracts. It will reflect on the assumption with regards to either RPI, CPI or any other inflationary factors that it needs to consider and it will request a sum 
that covers all of that within this medium term financial plan application. Thanks for that, Adam. Andy, did you have an answer on the other point about um, it being able to be used by people not sitting in a physical space? Uh, yeah, just, yeah, just a couple of things I wanted to address. So first of all, um, the break clause. Again, I don't know the answer to that. I will find out whether there is a break, break, clause, in the, break clause in the contract. <laughs> um, and on to, I think it was your point, Vicky, about the time scale for the implementation of the other channels. So at the minute, there is no immediate time scale for that implementation as the priority has been to, been to ensure its existing voice contact is maintained between the new and the old systems. Um, but I will go back and say I would like a time scale for those other channels to be uh, to be implemented as soon as possible. So uh, I, will, I will come back come back on that one. And then in terms of my understanding, in terms of the, the ability of this system to be used remotely in other locations, that it will allow us to do that. That is my understanding of it. But again, I and uh, I'll, I'll come back on that one. And thank you for not being too tough on the technical question where I'm clearly not as brief as I should be. Thank and you. nor should we be expected to be because uh, it's about <clears> strategy. And <throat> um, Councillor Hadley, you had something else to say? It was just it was just uh, in, in, the, in the, the paper just below the table, there's a paragraph which I had to read several times before, but it does talk about the RPI increase only applying after the, the end of the third year. Uh, um, so I'm not sure whether that's actually correct or not because uh, uh, Mr. Richards didn't pick it up and he's going to be pretty sharp on that sort of stuff. Um, so it, it may be that the RPI increase only happens after the third year, but I'm, I, I, you know, that's just what's in the, in the paper. Mm -hmm. The other thing, just in terms of, of people re remotely, is is what is the flood capacity? Because I suspect if it's a um, software as a service, it will be based on the number of users or the number of calls. Um, so if we do want to be able to increase in response to a, a particular crisis or wanting to do something, there is something about what is our flexibility? So it's a question probably for Andy to take away. What's our flexibility to be able to double the number of call handlers? You know, is that an extra cost? What's, is, it, is it based on the number of calls? Is it based on the number of oper operators wherever they are located? It's, it's a question we probably should be asking or be clear on. Uh, Councillor Hadley, I, I think you may have misunderstood the, the paragraph. It says, i.e. if the effective date is 1st of March year one, no increase may take place before end of January year three. So I don't think it says it wouldn't. I think it was giving an example of how much in advance we need it. So if the effective date year one was 24, 25, it could take place in 26. But we so I think I think it's about the lead time for that change in price rather than it saying there won't be one. But I'm sure we can get that clarified. But I think I understand um, Mr. Richards' explanation about how we deal with costs that we know about and costs that are made assumptions going forward. OK, um, anything further on this one or are we happy to go to the vote? All those in favour of progressing as per the recommendations? That's carried unanimously. Fantastic. Agenda item nine is, oh, now, um, Councillor Earl, do you need to exit at this point? I do, yes, please. Apologies. Thanks, Councillor Earl. So Councillor Earl um, has to leave uh, at this point. Um, we knew that she would be leaving us at this time. Have a lovely holiday. Should... <laughs> Agenda item nine is the Highcliffe Seafront Area Parking Restrictions proposals um, and this is going to be proposed by Councillor Hadley. Um, Councillor Hadley, you have a seconder? Uh, I'm happy to second, Leader. Councillor Martin, that's great. Um, so Councillor Hadley, over to you. Thank you, Leader. Um, this is a, a, a series of of, uh, um, of mostly WL lines and, and no waiting uh, um, uh, throughout the, the Highcliffe seafront area, uh, um, partly to deal with with the uh, the numbers of people who come to the to the to the beachfront, and then then that creates problems for people on the high streets and in the residential uh, roads behind the front. Um, it has been consulted with uh, um, the, the public, and uh, and uh, um, as a result of that consultation, one of the elements, the Stuart Road, um, has been removed from the from the scheme. Um, that's particularly as a care home there that has a lot of staff and probably inadequate parking on their own site. Uh, um, but that's 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 part of uh, um, the consultation piece. So uh, um, it's 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 reasonably straightforward. Obviously, it's something that uh, um, Councillor Martin may well want to add, add add some more detail on that. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Just to say that you'll be pleased to know I know more about parking in Highcliffe than I do about telephone systems. 
So um, um, actually, I don't have an awful lot to add, just to, to say that I fully support the, uh, the report and the traffic orders. Um, and I'd like to thank uh, our traffic team officers, Matthew Carruthers and Andy Brown, who've done a great job with the residents. Um, and getting all this in place. Uh, the, the report is, or, or the, the proposals are supported by the Highcliffe and Watford Parish Council and the Highcliffe Residents Association, uh, who have been calling for um, additional restrictions and additional, additional um, uh, regulations. I would just note that um, some of the objections, which were sort of, I think they were, they were objections you, if you know, if anybody's read the report fully, you'll see that there were quite a lot of number of object, quite a lot of objections to this. But actually, a lot of them were from Stuart Road, which has been re uh, withdrawn, as Councillor Hadley said, and also from Montague Road, where the residents have no objection to the the, the yellow lines around around the the, the corners and the bends. Um, but they uh, obviously want further restrictions in other parts of the, uh, in, along the whole length of the road. In fact, so that's why they objected. Um, so in fact, when you take those to factor those. Uh, those objections out of it, um, there is there is a lot of support in the in the residents for it. Um, it would be helpful. It is helpful that that the the residents in Montague Road, who have been campaigning for several years for the additional restrictions, we will be looking at that early in the new year. So uh, I think that's that's also very helpful. Um, so happy to support this. Thank you very much. All I would note is that um, the photograph in the report. Is Boscombe rather than Highcliffe? Not that not that that's um, feeling any paranoia we have in Highcliffe about about being forgotten, but it's not Highcliffe. But hey, it's only a small matter. Nobody will notice. Oh, thank you. My goodness. Okay, so moving swiftly on. <laughs> Does anybody have anything they? I mean, I suppose my only comment on this is around if we're if we're adding parking restrictions, um, having the confidence um, that we have the capacity to enforce those parking restrictions, given the difficulties that we have as a um, as a council in being able to recruit enough people to enforce parking restrictions and to keep our, our roads safe for everyone to use. Um, so, you know, obviously, the more restrictions we put in, the more capacity we need to, to deal with them. Does anyone have Apart from the issue about Boscombe, does anyone have anything they want to speak about on this one? I know it is very particular to the area. We've not had any representations from the um, from anybody locally. Councillor Hadley? If nobody has anything to add, Councillor Hadley can sum up and progress. So the Boscombe picture is, is, is mar mar the marina, and I was sent pictures of that uh, recently with people parked all over the pavement. So we can tell that's not a new that's not a not a new new photo. Um, it's on every uh, on every one of these, and I think that there was a suggestion it doesn't need to be changed. Um, in terms of enforcement, that that is a problem. I think it's a problem on the whole seafront, and I think you know there is something for me in terms of this is this is solving a problem in Highcliffe. But I know from when I was portfolio audit before that, that there are problems right the way along the seafront, and there are other areas that we also need to deal with. Um, but uh, you're absolutely right, leader, in terms of, of uh, um, uh, people take take the law into their own hands and seem increasingly to ignore uh, restrictions like W Airlines, and, and we need to uh, um, we need to show that we uh, we can't tolerate that. We need to and I know you've been lobbying the national government to uh, to to get the fines increased to uh, to make make people think twice. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Hadley. So on that basis and yes i have been lobbying had a meeting with the roads minister um we're going to be following up that uh with um letters to try and make take some action on uh, the ability to put reasonable fines on people who insist on breaking the law uh so any nobody else wishing to speak on that so all those in favor with the proposals as per the paper that is unanimous that brings us on to the final item and sadly Councillor Canavan, who was very keen to speak on this item, has had to leave us. So he is going to speak to you directly, Councillor Burton, uh, with his um, his concerns and issues on this. So that takes us to agenda item 10, which is entitled Accelerating Timeliness, being presented by Councillor Burton. Do you have a second, Councillor Burton? Councillor Brown is seconding. So uh, Councillor Burton, over to you. 
Thank you, Leader. Yeah, this, this paper is to approve a, a 784,000 one-off investment in the Children's Services SEND service to manage the backlog funded from Pacific and uh, earmarked for reserves. So just a bit, bit of background. In June uh, 2021, BCP was subject to a local area of special educational needs and disabilities SEND inspection. Um, to help everybody understand the timeline of this, this was before and separate to the full IVAC discussed at the last council, which ha happened later the same year. This resulted in a written statement of action. Uh, one of the key weaknesses ident identified in the SEND inspection in June 21 was the poor performance around issuing educational health and care plans, the HGPs, within the required statutory timescale of 20 weeks. At this point of the inspection uh, took place, the average performance was around 31.2%. Uh, there has been progress addressing the written statement of action. However, it's not produced the improvement needed in the timeliness of the EHCPs. Uh, if you look at table four, you can see the true extent of the problem. Uh, we need to invest to help solve this unacceptable backlog. Um, I would say that the 20-week target isn't my biggest worry here. It's actually the number of children, young people who are having to wait many weeks more than 20 weeks, uh, that, that can be seen by the average figure of 44.5 weeks. And it's, to be honest, this figure that's the most keen to see come down. Uh, remind, remind of that uh, 40 weeks is, is the average school a year. Um, there are many reasons for the backlog and delays, which are mentioned in the paper. Uh, some are national, some are more specific to BCP. Um, there has been some recent improvements, uh, successful commissioning for future Ed site capacity, uh, review of education, health and care needs assessment process completed and new multi-agency panel agreements now in place. Uh, recruitment completed for all same case officers and business supports. Uh, annual review backlogs are reducing slowly. Um, better support and use of the graduated response, which enables children and families to receive the right level of support, leading to less EHCP assessment required. Uh, development of robust governance through the appointment of a DFE advisor, John Gochlin, to chair the SEND Improvement Board, and uh, joint senior leadership oversight and management through uh, consideration journey of, of funded posts with health. However, these improvements have not reduced the backlog as hoped. This investment will enable the backlog to be addressed. Thank you, Councillor Burton. I need to declare an interest. It's not a pecuniary interest. Uh, but I am one of those parents uh, who did not get their EHCP anywhere close to 20 weeks. It was probably was more like 40 weeks. The journey started in September and we got it on the 17th of July this year, losing a whole school year. So um, I do have, I suppose that's not a pecuniary interest unless I decide I have to go and pay for private school. But um, am I allowed to uh, vote on this one? I think you should abstain for this. Thank you, Ingrid. Yeah. Um, councillor Bartlett, you're the only councillor left. Would you like to speak on this? Yes, thank you, Leader. Yeah, um, what I found troubling when I read the paper was that I was conscious of the fact that in this year's budget, uh, we had an increase in um, the budget of over £14 million to support children's services. And given that this, this backlog is historic, um, then there would have been a basis for increasing the budget to cover this particular backlog in, in care plans. Uh, so, I, you know, and I, and given the extent of the increase um, in there, one wonders if 784K is actually going to be enough to fix this problem. Uh, it, 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 you know, it really is difficult to understand that given the extra investment in children's services why at this point already in, in this financial year asking for another three quarters of a million pounds uh, so i it just i just put that as a question clearly if officers believe this is what needs to be spent but i question well you know is it enough uh, given how much money has already been invested thank you leader uh councillor brown Thank you, Lisa. Yeah, I'll only speak briefly, and, and actually to pick up that point, it's a really good point, isn't it, that we've been told year after year, at budget time, that, you know, 
the previous administration was investing multiple millions in our children and adults and other areas, you know, and, and a lot of us sort of questioned that. And it, I think a lot of it wasn't investment of that money; it was covering the increasing cost of delivering those services. You know, whereas when you say investment, you tend to think you're investing in improving it and doing things better and doing more of it, but actually it was just covering the cost of increasing increasing costs of delivering those services and I think this this laid that bare a bit doesn't it because when you look at the numbers they're not good and the, the sort of deterioration in, in, over, over the last few years when supposedly multiple millions were being invested in, in this area um, I, I tend to sort of trust my colleague and believe that you know this one-off spend is is about clearing that backlog and once that backlog is cleared then we can just keep coping with, with, with what's coming through the door I think we really need to sort of keep a close eye on these numbers because you know the, the numbers of the, the requests for these assessments comes seems to vary and, and it can go, can go up and down and I think it is just one of those areas that I'm sure my colleague Councillor Burton will be sort of keeping a check on this with officers because it's if we make this one off investment in actually clearing that backlog we don't want it to then start creeping up again and we're here again in a year or two's time and needing another one-off investment to clear the backlog. We need to have, make sure that we have a system that, that delivers for, for parents. You know, I, like Councillor said, you know, I, I've known lots of parents in, in my ward and, in, and, and others who have struggled sort of get, getting these assessments for their children and it really does have an impact. So we really do need to make it a real top priority to address, um, to clear this backlog. And then I really hope that, you know, we can keep a close eye on it on a month to month basis to make sure that you know things aren't slipping and, and that when, where they are that you know the right resources are being put into to con continually keep on top of anybody else wishing to speak on this one Kathy did you want to add anything uh, only in terms of um, absolutely picking up the points in terms of robust governance uh, around the management of this. I think it's very clear from the report in terms of the, the spend and the ask is about an additional team. So that's the additionality of the funding, which, which would not have been recognised um, previously. Um, and absolutely take the point that in terms of managing the backlog, we need to ensure that this isn't a one-off manage the backlog and then the backlog returns. It is about the wider processes and structures that we have within that service and making sure that's delivered. Um, I think that we now have much more, um, uh, we will be strengthening in terms of our governance around uh, this work, specifically around having John Coughlin as the DfE advisor chairing that. Um, and having the DfE uh, interest across that and against the, sa the same work. It was a delivering better value work. It will go into the safety valve work. But equally, in terms of that, that monthly, month by month governance arrangements in terms of that, we're currently undertaking a very clear diagnostic across the system to ensure that we really have an understanding and a clear breadth of what, what we're doing, but also understanding why some of the structures and processes that we've had in place, like the written statement of action, have not been as effective as we had anticipated, and so we can have uh, services going forward. So lots more to do in this, this, this work, and this is something that goes towards managing that. It's also about how we support, um, how we engage with our partners across the system, and how we engage with our health partners and education. And so again, a lot more work in those areas in terms of how they can support us in developing and providing a robust structure and system for parents and children. Because as, as you say, to wait that long is not acceptable. Ingrid, can I ask a question? Yeah. Am I allowed to ask a question? Thank you. Just didn't want to it, you know, abuse my position. Uh, clearly, I'm not going to ask a question about my situation. That would be wrong. Um, paragraph 20 talks about six full-time equivalent educational psychologists for a period of six months at a massive cost, half a million pounds. Um, the, the amount that these uh, wonderful professionals, you know, our experience with the EP was amazing, um, but it is an eye-watering amount of money that they're able to charge um, for their services. Um, my understanding is that is one of the main reasons for the delays. 
and given that we're only expecting the number of children uh, who are presenting needing EHCPs to increase, um, what is actually being done to to deal with that? Because after six months, that's still a massive cost, which we won't have budgeted for based on the, the daily rate. So, so uh, there is uh, absolutely the cost of the daily rate of um, the agency EPs has increased significantly, and that's a national issue because it's a very competitive market, and so demand outstrips supply. Um, there is internal work in terms of um, how do we recruit and retain our, our EPs. We've also developed a um, assistant EP scheme where we've added capacity in the system. And so that then relieves the EPs that we do have to do to do the um, the work that enables us to, to get the EHCPs where, where they, they are. We have to look at the processes, but we also have to look at our recruitment and retention. And we have to look at there are different models in how councils employ EPs or not. Uh, and so commissioning uh, a hybrid working, which means that we commission some and we have some internally. And so you, you create an environment where you actually decide how you're going to work with EPs and how we're going to work uh, to recruit and retain them. And so there are varieties of models that, that, that are there in other councils that we need to look at and look at what might fit best for us. So EPs do obviously statutory work, but EPs are very important in developing research, um, getting out in schools and doing a whole range of work. And so how do you create an environment that uh, excites an EP, not just the statutory work, but does some of those other things as well. And so we need to really look at that. And so our offer, uh, whatever that might be and whatever shape that might be, uh, attracts EPs to BCP. Thanks. Councillor Hadley, did I see your hand or was it Councillor Hannah? Councillor Hannah. Uh, thank you. I was going to refer to exactly the same table, uh, but more in the context of Councillor Bartlett's query as to whether the uh, amount that we're investing is of the right order. Uh, and the table uh, indicates to me that some real thought has been given to the amount of professional support that is required in order to deal with the backlog. And I assume that that has also been calculated in terms of the amount of time needed to deal with individual cases on average. Uh, so I am reassured by uh, the nature of that table that yes, the amount being requested is uh, of the appropriate order and I will be very happy to support the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks. Now Councillor Hadley does want to speak, followed by Councillor Brown. Sorry, ever such a quick one, and it does to tie to the, the, these these uh, e, 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 EPs. Um, um, uh, Kathy mentioned Kathy Hadley mentioned the uh, um, the work to try and improve our capacity internally, which is which is really key. But agency staff are always very expensive, and you talked about daily rate. If we're if we're having six on a six month basis, I, I really hope that we are negotiating as hard as we can to reduce the daily rate because we are guaranteeing work for six months. So it's a, you know it should be a, a different conversation. One hopes, but I'm sure you're on that. Thank you, Councillor Brown. Um, yeah, and I've spoken already. I was just, just, just really going to add that, it, it, as I said, this is important, and as it says in the report, to have these ed, these assessments done and get these education, health, and care plans to enable the, the the children and young people to reach their fullest potential, particularly from an educational point of view. But we also need to, you know, from a health and care point of view, that this is a, a sensible investment, not just for the fact that these children and young people deserve it and, and, and need it, but in terms of a long-term financial investment, because these children and young people, you know, grow up, they get to 18, they, and, and certainly we're seeing pressures within adult care services of those transitioning from young people getting to 18 and, and needing more sort of health and care support as adults. So um, this is a really important investment to, specific, firstly, for those children and young people and those families and the parents, but also it makes sense financially that if we don't get it right for them at a younger age, then those issues would only grow and be more significant as they grow as adults. So we need to sort of, the whole prevention agenda for the health and care sector is really important. And that's why the government are pushing the whole integrated care system. So it's really important to get this right, uh, the age for children and young people, so that we can manage their needs adequately as, as adults as well as they grow up and actually have the right finances for, for adult services as well. So. 
Thanks, Councillor Brown. Anybody else wishing to speak? If not, I will pass back to Councillor Burton for any closing thoughts. Right. Well, thank you very much. Um, yeah, just to pick up a, a couple of things, um, I would like to echo that the uh, the governance that the governance is a lot more robust now and is becoming um, even more robust. Um, the money. I, I'm sort of wishing somebody mentioned that we could have asked for a little bit more uh, yesterday, uh, but uh, uh, because I might have done that. Uh, but um, I, I'm as, as you said. The, the evidence, the tables, um, to me, looks like the right amount has been um, asked for. J just to come back to the um, the uh, EP time, yeah, uh, we've had a lot of discussion about EG e time. Um, from memory, I think it takes two and a half days of EP time per um, EHCP. Yeah, I think that is, is a, um, so. So you can see uh, that, and that's just one step in it. Um, and and you're right looking at inventive ways of, of trying to reduce that amount of time by putting the support in and, and making yeah because that part of the ep's job is probably not their most exciting and uh, not um it, it, it is very much paperwork orientated um, um just highlight future press and, and councillor brown sort of uh, uh, alluded to, to this really in what he just said of, of course we have to remember that get clearing the backlog will add pressures on the budget in other places because of course when these the, these the plans get put in place the money will need spending to fulfill those plans and that money will have to be you know, put more pressure on but further down the line of course um doing that will, will reduce pressures later on because they'll put the support in place and hopefully it will reduce more uh, intervention required later on and, and anyway um leaving a backlog to save money isn't the right thing to do um, and, and, and getting rid of the black blog, so is. Thank you, Councillor Burton. So, um, with all of that, uh, can I take a vote on all those in favour? That is everybody, six people. Um, if you can mark that I'm abstaining, not because I'm abstaining, but because I have a personal interest. Okay, that takes us to uh, the next agenda item, which is urgent decisions taken by the Chief Executive in accordance with the Constitution. Um, Mr. Farrant, do we have any? None since the last meeting. Actually. It's because we've only it's we've had two meetings this month, isn't it? <laughs> Fantastic. And agenda item 12, which is the Cabinet Forward Plan. Uh, oh, oh, hang on a minute. Councillor Hannah. Uh, thank you. Could I just refer back to the 26th of July meeting uh, at which uh, we agreed to invest a substantial amount of money in the Children's Services Building Stronger program uh, and also agreed that the business case would come back to the December meeting. Uh, I'm not sure that I can find that on the forward plan. I stand to be corrected. Okay, so I was just I was just exploring the uh, that we're now going to talk about the cabinet forward plan. You are so quick. Uh, so the latest version has only been published today. Have you checked the today version? Because I haven't had a chance to read it yet to see if it's there. If it's not there, uh, then uh, Sarah has confirmed that she's happy to pick that up. Uh, I have not yet seen the today version. So given that uh, we haven't yet seen it um let can uh, can we take it that we will make sure that that is resolved um and added to the forward plan for you say we agreed to take it in december and councillor burton is nodding okay so we'll note that to to be added to the december forward plan um we don't tend to discuss the forward plan because it's been circulated and it is available for the public to see um but it is our intention to try and build that forward plan in a robust way over a six to 12 month forward period to enable scrutiny to to think about that in terms of what they want to do on their agendas going forward rather than doubling up on things or pulling things out at the wrong time so with that um it is my job to formally close the meeting at 12 34 thank you for all, all for your attention and um have a good day